passed away. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. Brother Abdul Razak passed away. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. Sister Zahira passed away. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. And Dr. Ali Khan's uh, wife's mother passed away. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. Please make dua. May Allah give them Jannatul Firdaus and give the family sabr inshallah. And also brother Habib Muhammad having a surgery today. He lives in Garland. May Allah give him shifa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi We implore the Almighty Allah that He forgives them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them with His mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give patience to their family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the transition to the final destination easy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. Brothers and sisters in Islam, knowledge is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was given to us for three core reasons. Number one, to humble us. Knowledge is a weight. When a person picks up anything heavy, which is outside of the norm for them, they have this, the body is inclined to it, and, and they go down. There, there's a humbleness, it's a physical humbleness. Now you have to carry two sacks of rice, which you're not accustomed to carrying, uh, your body humbles itself. When revelation came upon Muhammad and Mustafa sallallahu the camel would sit down. The camel would sit down because this knowledge has weight. The knowledge is supposed to humble me. Number two, it came to unite the masses. Knowledge is the glue, it's the gel that brings people together. Because when every human being sees that knowledge to be applicable in their lives and something for themselves, and thus every human being starts doing the same thing, it brings people together. And lastly, knowledge is to make life easy for those who don't know. Whenever the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or the Sahaba Kiram or the scholars who Allah had blessed with wisdom and foresight, used to speak on an issue or propagate a message or even answer a question by giving a fatwa. They did it after they put themselves in that individual's shoes. And thus that mercy, that understanding surpassed, it preceded what they had in their mind of the text. They didn't go outside the text. They didn't go outside the realm of Sharia and Islam, but they stayed within it in accordance to the person that they were talking to. Now, what am I saying this for? So tonight after the prayer, I think we had a guest here. And he had his children. And during the prayer, the children were being children. Never say children are making noise. Children are being children. That's what they do. And they should be allowed to do it. Yes, this may not be the right place and time, but if they are not taught, they're not going to learn. And if we are harsh, they're never going to come back. I know some of us might have been distracted in the prayer. Two kids running around, playing tag, one's laughing, one's screaming, which was fine. But you can tell after the prayer, the father was quite upset, and he took his children out, and one of them started crying. In my heart, I said, why have we allowed a culture to be created in our masajid where if someone's cell phone goes off or someone's child makes noise, they fear the wrath of someone. I'm confident no one said anything. Please don't take me wrong. No one said anything, inshallah. He left. But he felt shamed. He felt unease. Remember the time when Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anh, would be on the back of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during prayer. It happens. It's not a daily thing. But I want us to analyze through this one incident how by not 
keeping that mindset that people that come here may not be on the same level of spirituality, knowledge, understanding as I am. So what do I do then? I allow them to go in their time. There are date trees that go within two years, and there are date trees that go within ten years. No one says a date tree that goes in ten years is less value. Matter of fact, it has more value. Its dates are worth more money. Why? Because with time comes the perfect product. So our masjid, as we produce these perfect human beings, inshallah, to the knowledge of deen, we humble ourselves. Because the weight that we carry is supposed to. Number two, we apply it and create a system of application for each person. And any time you want to say something or even look, sometimes it doesn't have to be words. It has just has to be the look. You know, the second salam goes uh, uh, more than 90 degrees. You know, this is your 90 degrees. It goes 180. Like, you know, what, what, what's your problem type of thing? You know, everyone starts looking in that direction. Like, what is your problem? No. Focus forward. Make your istighfar. Make your dua. The person who is in this position should never feel shameful. They should never feel unease. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that will judge. Yes or no? And when Allah will judge, I have no authority or place to be in that position. With that, we're going to talk about two points, and I'll end with the story, inshallah. Talking about when we don't use that humbleness, what it does to others. In regards to garments, and this is the final two points in regards to garments, and this is pertaining to the women folk. We find that wearing clothing that is loose, modest, and concealing is what Islam promotes. Islam as a faith, does not promote a certain dress. Islam, as a faith, does not promote a certain item. Just keep that in mind. And if you have questions, go to Turkey, go to the Top Kapi Museum, and look at the dress of Fatima radiallahu anha, and tell me, was that what you and I assume to be Islamic dress? It has to be loose, modest, and concealing. Not to wear clothing that is skin tight or revealing. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha reported that Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anhuma entered the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wearing a thin garment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned away from her and said, Asma, when a girl reaches womanhood, it is inappropriate that anything of her to be visible except for this and this. And he pointed to her face and her hands. I.e., she was a growing woman. She was no longer a child. So he said, you can't come around like this or go around where your clothing is such that it may show your body. The clothing may be loose, but it may be see-through or semi-see-through. This clothing is not good anymore. So he told her with some little harshness. Why? Because Asma was like family. And so he reached out to her in a manner with love and compassion from his heart. He never pushed her down. Rather, he said it in the tone because he cared about her as one of the ummah of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Number two, and the final. For women to wear a headscarf, which is also not transparent and see-through. There has been so much focus over the years that women have to wear hijab, 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 right? And we're still discussing it, deliberating it with the greater community. When we go out there, we talk in our workplaces, why I wear hijab? I said in my khutbah, in our New Year's resolutions, if you remember, if you recall, we're not talking about these things anymore. It's off the table of discussion. I wear what I wear, I do what I do, this is my religion, let's go forward now. Muslims cannot be in the same cycle of explaining hijab. But what it did to our societies, let me tell you what hijab did to our societies. When it was imposed and enforced as a piece of cloth that has to go on one's head, three things happened. You go to UK, you go to England right now, you'll see girls and women who wear hijab, but the hair is sticking out, and they have tight jeans and they have tight garments on. 
it became a style. Or you have a culture where everyone does what they want to do, and when the Quran is being recited, you put the hijab. It's over, you take it off. Hijab is not a cloth, brothers and sisters. Hijab is the modesty that you represent. And one of its representation is the covering of the head. It's the crown of a Muslimah. It is something that we wear with honor, like a person, a police officer, or a military uh, general wears their badges with honor. This is our honor. Let's not impose it. Let's not enforce it. Let's not demonize. Lastly, let's not demonize those who don't do it. Islam in this knowledge is for who? For who? For me. Who is it for? Me. It's for myself. When I see others not doing what I know to do for myself, I should not look down upon them. I should not demonize them. I should not discredit them from Islam, nor should I write them off. And this is the story with which I end. I think I said it once in one of my classes, but I'll say it again today. One day we came to our masjid. We parked our cars. The parking lot was on this side. The front door was on the opposite side. When we walked around to go into the masjid for Bohar, two women, young girls, in their teens, early adults maybe, wearing skirts and clothing where there was more revealing than a person would be expect to see, but it was Florida. I said, good afternoon, sisters. She said, salam alaikum. Right there, I felt like dirt. I said, why did I consider them not to be Muslims? Because I think a Muslim who comes to the masjid should dress as a Muslim should dress. But if she doesn't, does that mean she's not a Muslim? So that was there, a lesson for me. I said, wa alaykum salam. She said, we moved from Tampa. We're going to this university, FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast University. So we came to the masjid to get prayer time so that when we're in campus, we could pray on time. Let us think in for a moment. I said, Sister, um, I just got back. Uh, my office is over there in the other building. I need to go turn on my computer and print. So it'll be like five minutes. You want to go inside the masjid? She said, no, we're not dressed appropriately. I said, come under the shade. We have this shaded part of the house. Come under there. She said, no, we're fine here. So I ran to my office because other brothers were coming also. Quickly opened my computer, printed out from Islamic Finder. You know, in those days in 2004 and five, we didn't have all the good apps and stuff. We were still evolving that time. By the time I came back, they were nowhere to be seen. And so I looked inside the masjid, I looked in the car park, I asked other brothers, and one of them said blatantly, openly, <laughs> what, those? And he said a very derogatory term. He said, I told them to go dress properly if they're Muslims. Remember one thing. No one will destroy the deen of Allah. I will destroy the deen of Allah. My word, my action, my demeanor will destroy the deen of Allah. No one from outside is going to do it. Just remember that. And if anyone's doing something, it's because we've given them the model how to do it. We've told them how to do it. And we're telling them we find pleasure in doing it, so you do it also to us. It is time, it is due time that knowledge is for me. That knowledge humbles me. That whenever I talk to someone, I don't judge them. That I look at them as someone who is greater in Allah's eyes because Allah created them also. And then if there is some goodness in me, that goodness will rub off by my kind, good attitude and character, not by my mean, judgmental demeanor. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us true to himself. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us true representative of Islam to ourselves, our communities, our families, and to the entire ummah. And for that, brothers and sisters, ameen, rabbil alameen, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And for that, I ask from you one favor. Our fundraiser isn't because we just want to fill bank balances. We have work to do. And I've told you, I've committed to this community because I want to do that work with you. I'm honored to be a part of this community. You have allowed me to be a part of your community. Let us get some work done. Let us empower our adults, our seniors, our children, our young adults to be those representatives of goodness that the world will say 
if it wasn't Islam, I wouldn't have known, but this person is good, and if Islam is that good, then I want to be a Muslim also. Let us become that ummah, inshallah. Let us become that community. Buy those tickets, come to the fundraiser, support your community growth, your family's future, your community's future, and the ummah's future. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.